Hey everyone, welcome to Pencil vs. Pixel. I'm your host, Caesar, and I'm very excited to introduce today's guest, Brad Frost. Brad, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me, Caesar. Brad Frost is a front-end web designer, a writer, consultant, and speaker. He plays a major role in the in mobile web and the responsive design movement. So Brad, for, before we continue, pencil or pixel? Pixel all the way. I hate paper. <laughs> With nice. a burning passion, seriously. Whenever, whenever I have to write anything down uh, on paper, I know somewhere along the line that needs to get converted into pixels, into the digital realm, right? So anytime I have to apply for anything on paper, all I can think about is some poor lady or guy sitting behind a desk copying in my hand chicken scrawled notes. <laughs> and putting it into a computer somewhere. And the same thing goes with to-do lists, same thing goes with anything. I, you know, I, I have attempted to remove as much paper, as much pencil from my life as possible. That being said, I do, from a sketching standpoint and stuff like that, like that's, that's a little different, um, you know, sort of generating ideas quickly and stuff like that. That certainly has its benefits. But yeah, I pretty much exclusively live in the digital realm. So Brad, I, I've given a little background about you, but let's get to know you a little bit better. Go ahead and give us a go ahead and give us an overview of what you do. Uh, it's really hard to say. <laughs> a lot of people, a lot of people are actually ask me. They're like, well, "What actually do you <laughs> do?" And I, I don't really have a good answer. It sort of changes from day to day. But um, yeah, I do. I do some uh, uh, some web design work. So I'll do HTML and CSS from as a freelancer. Um, been doing a little less of that uh, recently, but earlier in the year I certainly did. Um, I do a lot of speaking, so I'll go to conferences and talk. I'll give workshops uh, at conferences and at, at companies. I'll do some consulting, go in and help people out. Uh, you know, with regards to this crazy web landscape we're all dealing with, and. Um, yeah, and and you know I like to write on my blog and uh, all sorts of stuff. But yeah, I keep my hands busy uh, a lot. I have a couple community projects and stuff that I work on as well. A couple products that are in early days. So I'm pretty ADD, so I jump around a lot. <laughs> but uh, I, I I came to the realization sometime last year that I can't dedicate. 40 hours a week to any one thing anymore. I'm, I'm too scatterbrained, I'm too ADD to, to hold down one, one job, one responsibility. So. How, how did you get started with, with uh, front-end web design? Yeah, so I went to university. I began as a, as a music major, actually, and then I switched gears into a program. Uh, I went to James Madison University in Virginia, and um, uh, they had a program there called Media Arts and Design, and in that uh, I had a web design class. Uh, we had sort of like a Photoshop slash Illustrator slash InDesign class, and then we also had a, a Dreamweaver class taught by um, an old uh, an old weatherman, actually turned professor. Uh, and then I had uh, two two um, uh, flash classes. And so that was sort of it, and um, yeah, so I, I did that, and then right before I graduated, uh, some uh, alumni came in, and they were talking about their experience. They were working out in the field for a couple of years, then, and then they said, you know, if you're interested in this whole web design thing, uh, you should definitely check out uh, Designing with Web Standards by Jeffrey Zeldman. And so sort of sitting unemployed in my sister's apartment in Pittsburgh. Uh, you know, I read that book and realized, you know, everything I learned up until that point was wrong. Wow. Uh, and so, you know, spent, spent time, you know, doing family members' websites and doing my own website and, and trying to learn and eventually got a job uh, doing uh, real estate and mortgage websites. <laughs> oh. And so that's, and that's and I was doing sort of you know both the design and and also coding it up and stuff like that and then um, moved to New York uh, worked at an e-commerce shop uh, uh, doing a lot of like fashion e-commerce stuff and then eventually moved over to uh, a much bigger agency RGA uh, 
doing, uh, that's where I got into to mobile uh, web development. And so, so yeah, so it's been sort of an interesting trajectory. But yeah, I come primarily from like a design background, not really from a programming uh, background, which is why I like to call myself a front-end designer rather than a front-end developer, because as soon as you say developer, uh, you have a bunch of people saying, oh, well, can you build these, this crazy MVC <laughs> JavaScript framework? And I'm like, N no, <laughs> no, I can't do that. I'm sorry. But uh, uh, yeah, developer equals programmer. And it, you know, oh, you, so you know Rails and write me some gems. No, I don't. Yeah, <laughs> I don't do that. So. so Brad, talk to us a little bit about uh, mobile design, responsive design. You're huge on that. You're, you, you're, you're all about it. Um, you talk about it a lot. What do people need to know about responsive design, about mobile design, about the importance of it? Well, for one, I mean, it's it's here to stay. I mean, that that's, you know, whenever I started at RGA, it was as a mobile web developer. That was the only job they had open at the time. And I was like, in my head, I was like, uh... Okay, that sounds okay. I guess I'll use this as my foot in the door and eventually get to make real websites. Uh, so, and that, that was my mental you know state at the time. And of course, you know a few months later, you know, this is in early 2010, so the iPhone had been out for a couple of years and you know it was, but it's still very much a nascent you know sort of technology. And um, you know, but it, a, a couple months into it, you know, I realized, you know, oh my God, you know, this is where everything is going. And sure enough, you know, the iPad comes out, sure enough, you know, everything else comes out and it's just the floodgates have opened. So all of a sudden the whole idea of what the web is um, has changed. And a lot of people, you know, whenever we talk about responsive design and stuff, people are like, oh, responsive design is so hard, uh, da, 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 da. Um, it's not. Uh, the the web landscape is is the thing that's hard, um, and and basically you know we're we're now developing techniques to help uh, you know provide a good experience to all these different devices to all these different environments and scenarios, and uh, I think it's terribly exciting. Uh, it's just like one big puzzle that we're is constantly shifting. Uh, with every device that Samsung craps out every 30 <laughs> seconds, you know, uh, but it, it's great. Um, and, but yeah, so I guess, you know, the main thing, the main thing to understand with this whole uh, responsive design thing uh, with designing for the multi-device web is that, uh, you know, it's not a parlor trick. It's not, you know, we're just making squishy websites for the hell of it. You know, it, the, the idea is that we're, it's imperative. It's our jobs now uh, to provide a good experience that you know that looks and functions beautifully across all these different devices. And um, you know, I think that responsive design for my money is is you know the best technique we have. Uh, well, that combined with a lot of the other stuff we talk about, progressive enhancement and stuff like that, right. um, to actually deal with this plethora of devices, both. Good, you know, large, small, fast, slow, crappy, amazing. So yeah. that brings me to another, my next question to, uh, about future friendly. Yeah. So it has a lot to do with this: the future of mobile, the future of web design. Talk to us a little about about uh, future friendly. Yeah, yeah. So the the term sort of arose uh af it was after a conference uh, the breaking development conference in in Nashville in 2011 and uh a bunch of people who all care about you know all working in the the mobile web field uh all sort of struggling with the same stuff uh we all got together to sort of discuss this you know about the challenges that we're all facing but then also try to you know get some common language down and this general notion of being future friendly sort of arose out of out of those uh, couple days together where basically you know the uh, the whole idea behind being future friendly is that we now have to acknowledge and and really embrace the fact that things are going to change you know this isn't about mobile this isn't about tablets this isn't about google glass this is about the ever shifting technological landscape, the device landscape, the, the, you know, the tools we use in our lives. Um, and 
it's crazy because, you know, even the people that get paid to think about this stuff, you know, on a daily basis, you know, writer like tech bloggers and stuff like that, it's a full-time job just keeping up with that. And so what does that mean for us as the people that are that are creating for for uh, you know, for all these different devices? It's like how do we uh, not just you know, create a mobile solution and then, oh, okay, the iPad comes out. Now we need a tablet solution and now all of a sudden smart TVs come out. Okay, now we need to, it's like we're, we're going to exhaust ourselves. So the idea of being future friendly is, is about being smarter, about sort of, you know, sort of embracing that unknown and saying, you know, what we're trying to do now is we're trying to create experiences that are meant to last, you know, beyond the scope of your project, you know, beyond... Uh, just you know this year's budget or something but to really sort of lay the groundwork for something that we could build upon over over the years something a lot more uh, uh, longer lasting and, and something that's going to be able to adapt to the future landscape um, and that's it's really tough to do and you're sort of again we're all like sort of shooting in the dark uh, mm-hmm. when it comes to this but at the same time I think that there are you know there are some some general principles and stuff that we could adhere to to better prepare our experiences for whatever comes down the line. I think Ziggy agrees with you back there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's bored. He's like, oh, get out of your chair. Take me for a walk. Take me for a walk. <laughs> so let's say I'm a, I'm a graphic designer, right? Um, and I have very little web experience. So what do you recommend for a graphic designer who has little to no web experience, wants a portfolio or something online, yeah. What should they start with? What should they do? Um, any specific um, tips you would give the, the designer who probably has some great work, wants to put yeah. it out there, wants to put it out there the best way possible? Yeah. Um, so, yeah, a few things. Uh, the first, I highly recommend uh, Code Academy's uh, Web Fundamentals course. Uh, my wife, who is more on the design end of things, uh, I mean, she's a award-winning graphic designer and, and, and all that. And, you know, she's been working on interactive experiences, a lot of, like, native apps, like uh, like Nike Fuel Band and stuff like that. But she, from a programming standpoint, from a tech standpoint, she's always been sort of, um, you know, a little lost on that, and she she really wanted to get into it, and she's married to me, who would try to show her, <laughs> and but I could only go so far, and yeah. she just got frustrated with me, and so we're like, okay, but then she she did the Code Academy uh, course, and in the course of like three days or something, she completed the course, and then she she was able to to design her own sort of one pager wow. uh, sort of portfolio website, uh, which is amazing uh and oh, yeah. so basically in 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 three days going from you know zero to to you know 60 uh is really really good uh so i think that that's a perfect primer for anybody looking to get into code um not just not just regular you know not just traditional graphic designers but anybody like I, i'd be happy to show that to my mom and stuff you know and she's an art teacher or whatever and my brother is a weatherman it's, it's stuff like that um so yeah, I highly recommend that. I like it a lot because it, you actually have to do it. Uh, it's not like a lecture thing, or you're what not like watching videos, and you could sort of skimp. It's like you actually do your coding the whole way, and they sort of introduce things and they talk, uh, you know, provide hints and stuff um, all the while you're doing it. But the whole idea is that you have to progress. You actually have to write code in order to like get to the next level and stuff which is really really cool um the other thing i'd recommend like a couple i think a couple books again designing with web standards i think is is still you know a really fantastic uh book for for sort of getting started with with code and stuff like that um there's a couple other uh really basic uh those sort of foundational books, uh, one by Jen Robbins, uh, Learning Web Design is really nice, I like a super nice primer. Um, but yeah, I mean, just just sort of, you know, learn learn the basics, and then the next step from there is learn, go out, buy your own domain name, set up a website, you know, make something that looks like MySpace circa, you know, 2003 or whatever, like, do do 
having your own domain, having your own space is your own playground. Yeah. And to this day, you know, I'm constantly, you know, I've, I've now had my, my site for, for six years. And to this day, you know, that's where I test new ideas. That's where I revisit my best practices. That's where I sort of kick the tires on new technology. That's where I figure out how to hook things up and you know I use WordPress and that's how I got into doing any sort of back-end uh, you know uh, programming is is because of WordPress and I was like okay well I need to spit out the, the title of the post how do I do that and it, and just learning from there is it's a very sort of organic it takes time but at the same time it's it's yours you know you're not you're not going to you know lose your any clients money or whatever it's just a really really good playground to to learn and to to grow um and get into it so highly recommend that very cool hey, Ziggy. Ziggy again <laughs> he's going through your bag yeah. it's my wife's bag i don't, oh. <laughs> I don't care like, it's fine <laughs> go ahead <laughs> Ziggy. Go ahead. so do you have um, a a set of sort of a set of commandments for for web design that you would recommend uh, for people some someone that's completely new to web design that's interested in getting into it but uh, needs a little more I guess set of standards or or... what do you think yeah I, I mean not really on the specific side of things just because like I I can't say from a from a web design perspective, oh, always do this, never do this. I anytime people so to speak in such absolutes, I get I get uh, really sort of nervous just because oh. it's like, oh well, why don't j- always use jQuery or, or you know always do this or you know this is the best and uh, so I, I get a little but I, I do like to to take a step back I, I sort of have three three general rules three general pieces okay. of advice three general ways I I try to live is basically work hard don't be an asshole and share what you know those are those are sort of my three commandments in in life and, and in web design and stuff where you know the the way we progress is you know there's really no substitute for you know for hard work uh, you know, you you don't magically learn. You, there are no shortcuts. There's all that. You know, there's the ten thousand hour rule to become an expert or whatever. But you know, you look at you look at anything. You know, you know the Beatles had their Cavern Club, where mm-hmm. they're cutting their teeth. They're playing seven, eight, nine hours straight. You know, in a night or whatever. Mm-hmm. Um, you know. There is no substitute for that. You know, th- those early jobs I had, my first web design jobs, it's, you know, it's long hours working for peanuts, but all the while, you know, learning, getting better, and, and continuing to, you know, break things and fix them and get better and move on. And uh, there's no substitute for that. Um, yeah. Second one, don't be an asshole. Or this is pretty self explanatory where, uh, uh, I think that we're we're extremely fortunate to work in work in a field that we don't have to be sort of used car salesmen. We don't have to lie to people in order to uh, earn a living. Uh, we don't have to be dishonest. We don't have to be cutthroat with each other. We could be a lot more collaborative rather than competitive. Um, and I think that that's I. I'm thankful for that every day, um, and I think that it's amazing that we're able to, you know, create a community uh, that is built around sharing and transparency and honesty and sincerity and craft uh, versus, you know, being making sleazy. money, <laughs> making money and being sleep. Yeah, exactly. Um, and then the last one, you know, share what you know. You know. I think that, you know, that's why we're here. That's why we're talking right now. And that's why I write on my own site. That's why other people write on their own sites. That's why people, um, you know, that's that's how progress gets made. You know, you could be doing some amazing stuff, but if nobody knows about it, um, uh, it's not going to, it's not going to be able to, to empower people to, to build on those ideas. So I think that that's, again, it's a, obviously a pretty fundamental principle of the web is is sharing and, and putting things out there um so yeah so 
Those, yeah. those are the three roles. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's great that you <laughs> those brought are up my three commandments. <laughs> yeah, it, it's great that you brought those up. Um, the last one, especially, I've noticed that right now one of your projects is uh, working with the Pittsburgh Food Bank, and you're documenting everything from the very beginning and yeah. and the whole process. Share with us a little bit about what made you. Because uh, I understand that you share what you know. You, you're very you're very transparent with uh, your knowledge and. And what you know about back, you know, front end web uh, design and 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 uh, just dig design in general. But talk to us a little bit more about that. I noticed that you have it laid out from the tweet that he sent out <laughs> to to uh, contracts, the process, yep. everything. What made you decide to be very very specific? And um, I mean, I, as a designer, I'm very thankful that you're sharing that. Yeah. Um... It's interesting, and I've I've been doing some research on on some other open design projects and stuff. I actually just published a post today on it. Um, sort of, you know, there certainly hasn't been the first uh, open design project ever. Uh, but I mean, there are there are specific things that I do. There there are specific ways that I think uh, that have that have arisen from other people's open design projects. Um, you know. Uh, uh, the lead for Starbucks, um, they did a responsive redesign and they published their uh, responsive pattern library, sort of their whole design system, and they, they put it out there for the world. Um, and that was amazing. You know, whenever I first saw that, I was I was you know so inspired by that. And now I'm I'm working on a tool to you know hopefully help people create their own sort of pattern libraries and, and design systems and stuff like that. But like that's I I think about how I do my job so much differently because those people were kind enough to share that with us. Um, and the other one is uh, Dan Mall was doing an open redesign for uh, Reading is Fundamental, which is like the Reading Rainbow company, really cool, um, <laughs> like dream client, right? Nice, um, yeah. And and he came up with something called Element Collages, which is sort of like, uh, if you're familiar with the concept of style tiles, uh, it's like a little more concrete than that, but it's still not like, you know, designing a full comp and stuff. And it's like, these are, you know, these are techniques that I'm, you know, absorbing and using in my own practice, uh, simply because other people shared them, and so uh, that was that's sort of the inspiration about why we wanted to do that. Uh, the other thing is just sort of the nature of the client. the 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 Pittsburgh Food Bank is that is actually just a wonderful organization. I've never worked for a client that has been. It, who's at its core is so sincere. Basically, their mission is to feed people, period. Uh, yeah. So, you know, <laughs> talk about, you know, like an honest mission. Uh, you know, there's no bullshit there. There's no sales pitch. There's no whatever. You know, their their goal is to, to help people. Uh, and so because of their goals, you know, their goals are to help people. Their goals are to, to sort of empower people. And they also, you know, stated to us that they – you know, they did want to be, because they're doing all these great things, they want to start to be perceived as a leader in this thing. And, you know, that sort of dovetails quite nicely into an open redesign where it's like, yeah, we, we're going to help you make a better, you know, site for you. Uh, but we're also hopefully going to be able to help other nonprofits, other food banks, other, you know, uh, people looking to update their own eight-year-old website. Yeah. And, and by sort of providing, you know, not necessarily a blueprint, but like here's what we did. Here's the steps we took. Here's the techniques we did. Uh, you know, we wrote about it um, for for you to to take and build upon or whatever. Um, that that certainly helps them uh, achieve their goals. I think a little bit, and uh, I'm I'm just really excited. It's still really early days. Um, you know, we're we're sort of in like the gathering mode where we're sort of gathering their stats and their brand assets and sort of just talking with people, getting like a feel for what people think of the site, what they want it to do, stuff like that. Um, but yeah, I, it's going to be great. I'm really I'm really looking forward to it. But I. As I said in my post today, I, I, I want to see more of that. Um, yeah. I think that there's like a sort of like a false sense of, uh, you know, oh, we have to play things close to the vest because, you know, you never know, like you, people are going to steal, gonna steal it. Yep. It's just, 
And it's like get get over it. Yeah, it's, what's your take on that? Because a lot of a lot of designers feel that way. If I yeah. if I put my stuff out there, someone's gonna steal it. Someone's gonna take my idea. I mean, I don't I don't believe that. But what's your take? Right. What's your take on that? Because a lot of designers need to hear, uh, or or artists in general, yeah. to hear a little bit more about um, you know the the benefits of putting your work out there without even making money off of it. Even if you just want to show the world, hey, this is what I've done. Um, what's the ben- what, what is the true benefit behind that? I mean, there's tons of benefits. Um, you know, like I've, I've found in my experience and just, you know, in the experience of, of friends that, you know, uh, give a lot away for free, uh, that comes back so much bigger than than yeah. you've you know than the initial effort you came in like I, you know it's been really nice that i haven't really had to do too much seeking at all to find work you know it all comes to me why because um i'm talking about things um that interest me and as it turns out you know it's it's interesting to other people and then you know people will want to hire me to come in or speak at a conference or whatever um and and it's great. So, so this whole idea of like sort of giving up like all your best, you know, tricks or, and, and techniques and stuff like that is a, is a little ridiculous. Um, even in, but even whenever you translate that that concept into the business world, I think that it's it's absolutely foolish uh, to to be so closed um, with regards to. You know, sharing your business model, sharing you know your your stats, sharing your your whatever, and that's a, something that I've been really focusing on is trying to get more people to publish their stats, publish their you know how people are you know interacting with their sites. You know, uh, yeah. there's uh, uh, an e-commerce company, uh, Homage, who did like a responsive redesign, and they he shared with me these amazing stats of how they're you know they're. You know, they redesigned, and all of a sudden, their mobile and tablet conversion rates and stuff are just like through the roof and stuff. And it's like, yeah, we need to we need to share that openly. You know, we need to get that information out there. And whenever you know, push comes to shove, it's like, well, they're a business, and they they don't really have any, you know, business reason for sharing that information. But at the same time, like, you know. It gets the word out about your company. First of all, uh, a lot of people who find that information valuable will perceive your company in a, in a positive light. Same way with me and Starbucks. I hate Starbucks coffee, but I love Starbucks as a company because their designers <laughs> shared, you know, the the tools they used, uh, yeah. and and I think that that's super cool. Um, so yeah, so there's a lot of there's a lot of good that could come about from um, from designing and sharing what you know rather than sort of keeping things close to the chest. Um, you get a lot of extra feedback and stuff like that, advice where I say, oh, I'm doing this technique. And then people say, oh, that's interesting. Why didn't you do it this way? Here's a link to that article. Or, you know, nice. oh, you're using this tool. Oh, well, here's seven other tools that could help you out. And I was like, cool, thanks. You <laughs> yeah. know, you get that for free. Yep. Um, it's uh, it's amazing, and so so the sort of spirit of collaboration, the spirit of, of openness and sharing knowledge and stuff, far surpasses any sort of you know competitive advantage that you'll get from keeping things under your hat. So yeah, right. we're gonna get more into the uh, the business side of things in a moment, but you said a word, and I couldn't help but bring this up: bullshit. <laughs> so let's talk a little bit about death to bullshit. It was yeah. a great presentation. I saw your. Um, your, the video, the uh, Creative morning, Mornings video, mm-hmm. and uh, took a look at your slides. I mean, it is uh, such an eye-opener. It's it's crazy how much things have changed and advanced. Let's talk a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, yeah, that's probably one of my favorite things I've ever talked about, and um, <laughs> hoping, hoping to continue uh, sort of building that up as sort of a, a thesis. But the, the general concept of death to bullshit is that there's more information now than ever before. Uh, we're basically generating things fast and furious. You know, more books have been published. You know, photos are being taken. We are, we basically have billions of people walking around with photo uh, with cameras in their pockets. You know, in the form of cell phones. Um, Web pages being built. You know, blog posts getting written. Magazines. You, you name it. Everything's on the rise. And as a result of that, we're also sort of generating a whole lot of bullshit. You know, just because there's more of it. 
uh, more information doesn't mean that all of a sudden, you know, it's all good. Uh, there's a whole lot of noise that we have to sift through. Um, you know, whether it's websites and sort of, uh, you know, a lot of the anti-patterns you see, overlays, you know, newsletter sign-up forms that are ticked by default, and just all sorts of creepy stuff like that. But then just generally just cruft, you know, just sort of, you know, unwanted information, just crap that's there for some marketing reason rather than serving the user, um, all sorts of stuff. And basically, like, the, the moral of the story is that, okay, we have all this information, the amount of time in the day isn't increasing, you know, so in order to get to people, in order to, we're all competing for people's attention with whatever we're creating, whether it's, you know, a web design, whether it's a painting, whether it's a book, whether it's whatever, uh, we're all competing for people's finite time. And in order to cut through uh, all that bullshit, all that noise that's being put out in the world, we have to make genuinely valuable things, things that are genuinely interesting, things that, you know, pierce through uh, all that noise and, and really, uh, you know, resonate with people or help them, you know, live their lives a little easier, you know, give them some information that they're looking for. There's, there's something that they find generally interesting. Um, and it's, part of that, it's, part it's of hard that is to the do. Transparency. Part of that is the transparency we were talking about, right? I mean, sharing, yeah, what you know, sharing your knowledge, putting it out there, um, showing people how you do things. And yep. not only are people very appreciative of that, but they learn and they also start to uh, contribute themselves, right? Yep. Um, but that's definitely that's definitely a very interesting topic. Where, where does everything go? What we're 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 creating such an immense amount of information where does it all go <laughs> well apparently is it we, stored we, somewhere or does it get crunched you know apparent, <laughs> compressed apparently we're apparently we're creating so much data now that we've actually run out of of the storage capacity to hold it all which is an interesting concept so yeah some of that does just evaporate somewhere but wow. the interesting thing and we see this a lot with the you know the general concepts of like big data where it's like we have like so much uh, information that you know to sort of sift through it all is is a fool's errand because you're never going to be able to do it but all that sort of information and in mass uh, becomes valuable in a different respect you know and yeah. you see that with a lot of the you know NSA stuff and uh, all that yeah but just Big data in general, you know, right. people are able to see trends just based on, you know, how much stuff, you know, is being put out there, and so you sort of uh, were able to learn things in a in a different way. Um, so yeah, so where it all goes is a, is a sort of an interesting <laughs> question because some of it is slipping between the cracks, but then uh, other stuff is is other information is sort of worthless on its own or seemingly worthless on its own right. but actually you know when when viewed as part of a whole uh is is actually pretty valuable so uh yeah interesting time has been in and it really depends like why is the library of congress storing an archive of every tweet that's ever been put out and and the answer is is that you know well maybe you know maybe we don't really see the value in it now or it has a very sort of limited uh, appeal in present day, but you know, one, one day down the lines, you know, being able to, to to look through these you know millions and millions of tweets, you know, maybe focus around a certain event or something like that, you know, we'll be able to use that information as as you know uh, as a way to to tell a story, you know, from a historical context or so. Who knows? Uh, you know, we're 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 at the very beginning of all of this, but I, I do think that it's important to um, to treat information as as a very valuable resource, um, yeah. it, and to to really focus on putting out good information <laughs> into the world. I think is is the the, the bigger challenge. So. Exactly. Um, yeah, it's crazy. Yeah, you, you talked a little bit about business um, earlier. What made you decide to to start working for yourself, to go into business for yourself as opposed to working for a, an agency? Sure. 
For me, I'm extremely fortunate in that it was a really natural transition. It wasn't, it wasn't like a screw this crap, I'm out of here, leave with both middle fingers up, any sort of thing <laughs> like that. Uh, it was, it was, it. A lot of people will leave their job because they they hate it, and right. I I left my job for the exact opposite reason because I loved it so much that. Um, People wanted me to talk about it with them. Um, people were interested in working with me and and stuff like that. And so it became this sort of you know it it sort of boiled over where uh, it was increasingly difficult to hold down a full time job and still pursue speaking, still going traveling oh, okay. around and talking about it. Um, and so, so yeah. So I made the decision. I I, I had a couple projects uh, lined up. Uh, you know, people, friends of mine that were uh, were like, hey, you know, we're going to be doing this. Would you be interested in, in in working on this project with us? And so there was sort of like a nice sort of you know, instead of stepping out into the cold unknown, you know, I was stepping out into a couple projects that I know would keep me busy and you know, pay the rent and stuff like that. Um, so, so it was, it was a really nice, smooth transition for me and that I, I would probably, I would recommend that for, for other people. If you're looking to, you know, there are some people that have some pretty crazy stories about, uh, you know, just stopping it, you know, just going into work and saying, I right, quit, see you later. And then it's like, now what? And then exactly. they figure it out after the fact. I think that there's a whole lot of things that you can do to sort of um, uh, prepare yourself for, for life as an independent uh, uh, individual working. Uh, like D my friend Dan Mall, he test drove his business. He like prototyped his, his, his agency um, mm -hmm. while he was holding down a full-time job. Uh, his agency is super friendly. Um, yeah. But and and he but he was basically working freelance as like a full time gig in addition to another full time gig uh, at the agency he was working for, and what he was doing with that is just seeing if he could handle it, getting a, a feel for you know the business aspects of it. You know what am I going to charge people? How am I going to work? together you know how am I going to sort of make connections with people and you know do contractors and stuff like that was he doing and, super friendly all, all on his own uh, I think at first and and now he has he, he has um, it, it's ultimately him but he has uh, some really great people and designers that he, he works with and they're all I think contracting with him but they're all sort of loosely under the same umbrella mm -hmm. um, but but I guess like the moral of the story is like there's a whole lot you can do if you're interested in going out on your own um, to to better prepare you for for what's out there. Again, back to sort of sharing what you know and stuff like having your own blog, uh, having your own presence, your own sort of stuff like that. Like again, like I've had my my website now for six years, and you know whenever I went out on my own, I didn't have to make a website I already had a little bit of gravity there and stuff like that and um, you know it was already sharing what I was interested in and so it made it a lot more easy to to sort of you know find work and, and you know have people get in touch with me so um, yeah so I'd, I'd highly recommend that start your own blog work on some freelance stuff get a feel for it if, if it's something you're really interested in like definitely you know dip your feet in the water you don't have to quit your job but like it is important to understand though that instead of coming home and watching real housewives of crappy town USA or whatever <laughs> uh you you can you know cut your teeth you know yeah. those those late nights again like back to this concept of working hard it's like sometimes you have to do that like and back to Dan like he's he's got a family you know and, and exactly. he was doing that but he, he was doing that so that you know he could provide for the family later on and eventually comfortably set out on his own and stuff and I think he's, he's a great example and I'm I'm pretty happy with my own path as well so yeah work you know work hard test things out keep learning keep sharing um, and then 
over time, I think hopefully it makes it, itself uh, you know clear to you that uh, maybe now is a good time to to cut the cord to go out on my own, stuff like that. So, is that what you would tell a person who was interested in doing uh, speaking to also to start by sharing what they know and um, yep, putting their work out there. Yeah, yeah, I get this question a lot. You know, a lot of people are really interested in speaking, and I'm re- I get really excited about that just because I think a lot of people have a lot of really valuable things to say. Um, and my general advice for that is, yeah, again, start your own blog. Talk about what interests you. Um, if that is interesting to somebody else, you know, that might be a conference organizer. That's what happened with me. Um, my well, now my friends uh, Jason and Val Head, they run an event in Pittsburgh, and they, you know, got in touch with me, and they're like, "Hey, you know, we we run this conference. We really like the things that you're writing. Would you be interested in coming and talking about it um, at our event?" I said, "Sure." Um, and I think also uh, meetups are really great. Uh, sort of great first step where basically, you know, uh, it's a smaller crowd. It's a local crowd. Your friends are there everyone's supporting you you know it's not like a big scary you know you're speaking in front of 800 people or anything like that it's just it's a it's a way to sort of dip your your feet into the waters without having to like commit to some you know big big event so uh yeah those are those are basically it i mean it's you know just dip your feet into the water talk to other people you know get comfortable but most importantly you know just be be really interested in something. Be passionate about something. Um, you know, work on things that generally excite you. And even if you're not the best public speaker in the world or whatever, uh, if you're excited about something, you can tell really quickly uh, who who's got something on their mind that they want to get out. And it's it's great. I love being at those uh, at those events where people you know, get up on stage and it might be their first or second time sharing what they know, but because they know it so well and because they're so excited about it, uh, it's just, it's, it's very infectious. Wow. So, Brad, we're about to wrap this show, but before we do, tell us about any exciting things that are going on. Oh, geez. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> Besides speaking and writing yeah, and, you know. I mean, yeah, there's... <laughs> There's always something. It's like uh, I'm I'm going to all these new exciting places. I'm I'm extremely thankful for that stuff. Um, like I go down to Louisville, Kentucky tomorrow. I've never been there. Nice. I'm really excited for that. And uh, just just other things. Um, I've also been working on uh, a few tools. Um, uh, with uh, well, one tool with a guy named Dave Olson uh, at West Virginia University called Pattern Lab. Uh, which is, uh, I alluded to it a little earlier, but it's basically like a, a community project that, that basically hopes to help people um, create their own sort of design systems and stuff to sort of like deconstruct the, uh, get away from like just making web pages so much, but rather give our clients and give, give our teams like a, a, a whole system to work with and stuff. So that's been really fun, and we've been sort of making some progress on that. Uh, working on a, a couple products uh, that are still like super early days, just like sort of more like you know brain dumps right now. Uh, the open redesign of of uh, the the Pittsburgh uh, Food Bank website, we're really excited about. Um, yeah, and just you know, getting settled into Pittsburgh is really exciting. I'm I'm around my family. Uh, my sister just had her her third kid and we're excited to I get to play uncle and stuff like that and uh, so yeah lots to be excited about uh, lots of cool stuff coming up um, I have 77 blog post drafts and oh my god <laughs> wow so yeah lots lots of lots of good stuff coming up and we could so. talk forever man we could talk for hours I was gonna ask you you know how you know what, what your system is uh, what, what system do you have to, to write your blog post but I mean obviously you, you've written a lot of stuff already right and you have it sort of in the bank, ready to push out. Yeah, I mean, you know, uh, I think that the main, my main advice for this, and and this is with any with any creative endeavor, is to strike when the iron's hot. You know, if you get an, a thought in your head, whether it's for a painting, like I have like five, six, seven, there's a couple in this room, uh, canvases lying around with like 
half painted stuff on it. <laughs> but the idea is like, nice. I see it all as like a, a bar chart where I have like 70 projects going on. And as long as I'm sort of making progress on any of those, you know, sort of moving those bar charts, you know, away from 0% and more towards 100, uh, then, then that's good. And that's why it's a very loose system. But basically, like, I strike when the iron's hot. Whenever I'm thinking about something, I'll try to get it all out as soon as possible. Sometimes I'll, on very few occasions, like, I'll actually be able to go from start to finish and then hit the publish button, like, really, really quickly, which is really nice, like, in the course of an hour. Uh, but then other times, like, you know, I'll have posts that are three years old but then, like, I'll start thinking about it again, and I'll come back to it and finish it up and stuff. And you know, it's it's sort of cool. But the the idea is to go where your brain tells you. You know, don't try to force yourself. A, okay, I'm gonna write right now because I have to. Uh, some people could operate like that. I, I, I can't. I I need to sort of be inspired to to work on whatever I'm working on. So um, I would I would generally give that advice but also under I mean I totally appreciate some people are really regimented where you could be like I'm gonna blog between 8 and 10 period and whenever wow. it's 10 o'clock I'm gonna walk away from it I can't do that so I think Ziggy's trying to sit down behind you <laughs> <laughs> <He's on. Look laughs> <at him. laughs> Brad where, where can we find you online besides uh, bradfrostweb.com where else can we find you uh, my main activity is on Twitter at Brad underscore Frost. Um, I'm there a lot. Again, you know, that's that's where the community is and stuff. That's where, you know, friends are and stuff like that. So, yeah, that's besides my website, that's where I'm at. So Nice. And everyone, you will be able to find those links and everything that we talked about today on uh, Pencil versus Pixel. That's, P excuse me, PencilVSPixel.com forward slash Brad Frost. Brad, thank you so much for your time today. It's been great. A lot of information. We'll catch you soon. Bye, everyone. All right. Thanks, Caesar.